In this next episode of Tea with Sarah, I'm interviewing Tarzem Singh. He's just finishing his next movie, Selfless, with Ryan Reynolds, and he's probably one of the most charismatic directors in the industry. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I hope you enjoy it too. Sarah, so okay. thank you for the cup of tea. Right. You love chatting, I, I love uh, chatting. There you go. You can tell me when you're, when you're fed up. We can stop. Oh, no, I can talk shit. I can't write a line where I can talk shit for hours. Your dad wanted you to go to Harvard. You were going to be a lawyer or something? An engineer, yeah. Or no, how, no, Harvard was supposed to be for masters in business, yeah. Right. And then you were determined to, to go and do film. Basically, if, if you know any Indian, I guess Jewish people are the same. You're a lawyer, engineer, doctor, or asshole right. for a parent. So it was just like, that is the thing that we always wanted to be, we were told you had to be. And I, I remember a book that changed my life was I saw a book that said, Guide to Film Schools in America. And it just changed my mm. life. And I just went, my God, this, teach this in school. Because if you're an Indian, you just think like, you know, you go to school to study something that you hate and your dad loves. Yeah. And it was just one of those. And I just thought, like, I have to, you know, pursue this. Right. So for me, it was like, you know, how to sleep with blondes 101. And I said, oh, they teach that in school. I'll be there. So I tried, told my dad, and he went, no, nah, if you're going to do that, not going abroad anymore, because he thought I jumped the boat correctly. So, really? so I cut the bus, Greyhound ticket. One big bag, 1984, the Olympics had just finished, wow. and just showed up here with just all the enthusiasm in the world. I couldn't get into any film school. I tried every one of them. So then I found out that City College was the first place that actually the first gay guy that I met who tried, who tried to pick me up on the street and we became friends, found out he was going to City College, and I went out then. He didn't go there. So he registered. No, he registered, and I made. I spent the rest of my money and got a fake ID, and went to school as Randy Marsh. So then, Fantastic. so my degree there was Randy Marsh. Then I got a job. I had three jobs, and yeah. absolutely loved the experience. I don't mean to sound like I was having a hard time yeah. and bitching about the work, because yeah. I loved it. Just doing what ordinary jobs and. Oh no, I was a busboy, and I yeah. sold cars. I, the worst one was I drove a rickshaw in Westwood. And after about four months of that, I said, this is pathetic, that I could have gone to Harvard, and I'm an Indian, and I'm driving a fucking rickshaw yeah. in Westwood. So I just, that was the one I said I shouldn't do. Yeah. And then after about two years here, I made a small film that I sent to Art Center, and they gave me a scholarship, and then I changed my name back to myself, to Thursday, and in Art Center, I was back to Thursday. I mean, a degree in film is worth toilet paper. Yeah. It means nothing. It's just did your you portfolio. Did you learn anything? Everything. You I think it took them a okay. stick to get me out of school. I did not want to leave. Yeah. I loved every minute of it, and I would never have left. But the, then you did very well pretty, pretty soon after, didn't you? When we came out, there was something in the water that year, because in the first year, when we went, there were, like, I think, like seven people in the class. And out of the seven, five came out and kind of changed the visual world in that same class. Right. And out of the seven, who, who I was me, Michael Bay, okay. Zach, the guy who wrote Pulp Fiction, Roger Avery, and then there was Larry Fong, who works with Zach all the time now. So there were like five or six of us, and when we came out, we were literally just came out working. Like the first video I did was Losing My Religion, then I went off to do that, yeah. and I was doing ads. And I have to say, that song and that video is just incredible. No, it was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing you pick up the awards and thinking, God, who is this person who's just like... Come it's on so today. funny. I'm so glad that nobody... I mean, like for me on that particular time, because I was working as a busboy. Literally two years before that, I was working as a busboy in Bombay Palace. Right. So when we got the awards, I wore... And I very rarely, except at home, I wear Indian clothes, but I yeah. very rarely wear Indian clothes outside. And I went to Bombay Palace and to have, a, have food, and I was telling them, somebody told the chef. So he came to say hello, and he said, like, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to get this... probably get an award, because we're nominated for eight. And he said, will it go everywhere in the world? He said, yes. And he said, then you've got to wear a turban. And he put his turban on my head. And now when I see those awards, I had this big yes. turban. I've never worn a turban in my life. All my friends in India were thinking, like, why the fuck are you wearing a turban? I said, the cook put it on my head. I never wanted to do movies. I was so happy just to do music videos. 
And when I got tired of that and I just thought, oh, I can't really relate to the music that's there, then I kind of thought like, okay, I want to do ads. And I love doing ads. And I always, the cliche that I always use is, you know, like I'm like a prostitute in love, right. you know, but it's professional, I'd fuck them for free, but they give me money. <laughs> and I'm happy with it, but I, I love it. Yeah. And I'd never faked it. Yeah. So from there, when I did movies, I wanted to do the movie at that particular point. So if you've seen me on a set in commercials, I mean, like for me, there is absolutely no distinction. Yes. I mean, I just, I just love the process of filming, right. just on how two particular images will come together. Then I really don't care if you're selling air, an ideology, or anything. I mean, like the best ad ever made is the Sistine Chapel. Then the Pope was paying the bill, and it's an ideology you're selling. And I'm sure Michelangelo had exactly the same discussions and problems that we have with with advertisers, which is like, you know, Pope is saying, please get rid of that painless, and he's saying, no, it's art, and no, da, 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 paint it over, and then all the, exactly the same discussions, where at least we're selling something material. Yeah. One of the first ones you did was at Levi's. It was, and that was, I, that's why I say downhill since, because yeah. my first video out of school was REM, yeah. and everybody always says that you were so lucky. But yeah. the guy said, well, I don't know. I think all you can do is increase the probability in your way. Yeah. I didn't know anybody, so when everybody just says the thing is you must have met people, you, you didn't. They see your work and somehow it increases your chances yeah. of at the right place being at the right time. Of course, 90% of it is that, but if you don't have the portfolio when you get your foot in the door, there's no point in getting your foot in the door. When we were working, the very first job, you were, you were developing the fall, and, and I think you put pretty well all your money into it, didn't you? Did I you did, know, and I lost thing. it all. Did you really? Yeah, it was so it was phenomenal. A, it was a fantastic film. No, oh, yeah, but that, that, does, that doesn't mean that you make money. There's two different things. One being filmed, being successful yeah. financially, and it being satisfying. So for me, it's much more of a cultish film. The people yeah. who love it will swear by it, and people who hate it just think it's the biggest turd in the world. Right. And either is fine for me. I was just terrified of Comsi Comsa. So it was everything, and I'd had it for a long time. For 17 years, I was location scouting for it. And then at a very critical time, I had kind of done financially well. I had my girlfriend suddenly left. I just was shell-shocked, and my brother turned to me, and he just said, you know, we're either going to be two rich brothers that are always going to talk about a movie that they never make, yeah. or we're going to make this. So yeah. I told him, OK, but I have no idea when this movie will finish or how much it will take. Right. So I'm going to go on this magical mystery tour, Call me if you're going to sell the house. And he said, okay. And after about four years, I called him and I just said, the movie's almost done. He said, you know, the house is almost for sale. And I said, okay, movie's done. So I came back and nobody wanted to buy it. And he said, so now we just let it go because nobody will see it either. Then I said, okay, let me work for another two years and then I'll take it out myself. Right. So I worked for another two years and then I put it into the theaters myself. So, and then people saw it then. I mean, people saw it, yeah. but they did, did really lost all, all, I mean, like all, I mean, like I was in a pretty lucrative industry in that particular yeah. time. I'd made so much money. Yeah. It was down to the thousands. It had all gone. Like yeah, fin yeah, Fincher always says it right. Fincher right. always says I would have been one. He said, everybody who's in advertising yeah. has a pet project. Yes. And they will always talk about putting their money in this particular film, this project that they love, and nobody does it. Yeah. And he said, he said, brave, and I, I think stupid. And I think the only reason I did it is where something very critical happened to me that time, which doesn't happen to most people, is life happens to most people. And that particular time, my life just disappeared. Yeah. And I had this thing, and I was so rudderless that I just said, you know, like, let's go on a tour. So I don't think I could do it now. I don't think anybody could, because all your money that you make until you're 41 years old, if somebody says, you know, put it into something, I just said, oh, yeah, put it away, let it go. You never did treatments and you never did storyboards on any of the jobs that I did. And I remember that what we used to do is just take you in to meet the clients. Yes. And then you would just like talk and talk <laughs> and talk. And then they'd be like, oh yeah, we've got to work with them. You know what? Two things. One, I was the guy who started treatments. I did it for one thing. And that was for Levi's. I used to do one of every 15 ads mm. that I got my way, that I prepared. So I would go into the client and say, these are the clothes, this is the song, this is this, this is this, and this will happen, and I would make this presentation. Yeah. And if they said no to one thing, I would say thank you very much, and I would leave. So in the first two years, apart from, let's say, PAs on the set, I made less money than the grips. I mean, and I didn't really care, because I, was, I had no expenses. Me and my girlfriend were living out of a trunk, and we were loving the work we were doing. So 
I was unfortunately the one that screwed it for everybody. But it was always when I had the job, it wasn't to get the job. Right. So when I had the job and they said, what are you going to do? And I would go in and do this. It was for pre-pro. But now it's used to sell the idea that the agency should have sold before. Well, no, they've sold the idea. Uh, they've uh, no, no, they've sold a one two liner. Yeah. And they're just thinking like, wow, the client thinks it's shit. But let's tell him that we got these five directors who can actually put meat on it. And then we'll show him what it really means. And then one of those is chosen. But you're not choosing the director with that. You're choosing the guy who hired the best company to write that treatment and pull the best visuals. Well, I'm not sure that's entirely true. I, I think, think it is. The treatments are just to make sure that everybody is understanding the idea and that we're all on the same page and mm -hmm. that we've all got the same vision because that's it's good it's, if you read it as that but i don't yeah. think everybody does but i usually tell them that you know it's it's the reason i think i always disagreed with fincher in the earlier days when he was saying we sh there shouldn't be the buffer in between we should be dealing with the you know with the clients and i said the reason that never works is that the work will never improve when an idea comes in you know like the client beats the shit out of the agency for months yeah. and dilutes it into like really something wrong and then or not wrong but really low with a common denominator then the director comes in and it can start going up. If you were involved in the earlier stage, what will happen is, I mean, the only analogy I can do is when we sold cars, you know, if somebody came and they just said, I'm looking for a red car. And you say, oh, okay, great, come in. They look around and they see a blue car that they like. They kind of won't buy it from you. They'll kind of go, well, I was looking for it. Then you kind of say like, oh, you know, I got this call, I got to go, but here's a friend of mine and make it look like the brief starts again. And you say, I got to go, but this guy will help you. And then the guy will say, what are you, what are you looking for? And, and the guy might say, well, this blue car is great. So you have to change the brief. I have walked in on things where agency has said the same thing for three months and the client says it's shit. The director walks in the same thing and they'll go, fucking amazing, genius. And that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Enjoy. You guys want to have some beers or coffees or what? Beer? You don't have to look at each other, but you're not. Oh. Who's driving? <laughs>